Hi everyone. In this lecture, we will talk about immune system anatomy. We're going to look at the clinically relevant anatomy of the immune system, including lymphoid structures and lymphoid organs. The immune system helps to guard against disease and tissue damage. It defends against invading microorganisms, helps to clean up and remove damaged tissue, and identifies and destroys abnormal body cells. Immune cells are found throughout the body, but are highly concentrated in the lymphoid tissues and in the blood. The lymphoid tissues will be the subject of this lecture today, and they include the bone marrow, the lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, tonsils, malt or mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, the appendix, the spleen, and the thymus. Let's start with the red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is the site of blood cell production or hematopoiesis, and that includes production of white blood cells in addition to production of red blood cells and platelets. We're not going to talk about the process of hematopoiesis today, but it's important to understand that the white blood cells are the central cells of the immune system. Red bone marrow is found only in select bones in adults. That is the pelvis, the vertebrae, the cranium, the mandible, sternum, ribs, and the proximal ends of the long bones, the humerus and the femur. Lymphatic vessels are similar to veins, except they're one way. They're a low pressure set of tube-like structures that move lymphatic fluid throughout the body. They're three layered vessels and they're very thin walled and they contain valves to help push the fluid up towards the heart. They will eventually return fluid to the subclavian veins on either side, the right and left subclavian veins, subclavian meaning below the clavicle. The lymph moves towards the heart by way of valves, the milking action of skeletal muscle or the pumping of skeletal muscle, contraction of smooth muscle in vessel walls, and pressure changes in the thorax. Yes, very similar to the way that blood moves through the venous system. I want you to basically know the major ducts of the lymphatic system, because this helps to understand how the lymph drains towards the subclavian veins. So if we zoom in on this diagram, what you can see is that we have the right and left lumbar trunks bringing the lymphatic fluid from the right and left lower limbs. And that fluid is then going to travel up to a large structure called the cisterna chile. The cisterna chile is where that fluid merges as it moves up into the thorax. Moving up into the thorax then, the fluid converges into the thoracic duct and the thoracic duct travels up through the thorax and then moves the fluid, moves the lymphatic fluid up towards the left subclavian vein. So the thoracic duct drains the right and left lower limbs and it also receives drainage from the left side of the upper body. So the left head, neck, and left upper limb, and left chest. So the majority of drainage in the lymphatic system goes through the, the thoracic duct. The remaining set of lymphatic fluid is going to go into the right lymphatic duct. So if you sort of subtract from the structures we haven't talked about yet, that would be the right side of the head, neck, right upper limb, and right chest. So pretty much everything but the lower body and the left side of the upper body. That's the right lymphatic duct. And that drains into the right subclavian vein. Here's a zoom in of those structures we just talked about. And let's look now at lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are tiny organs that are clustered along lymphatic vessels. They're less than an inch in length and they're lima bean shaped, very, very tiny. 
They're named for the region that they are located in generally, although there's individual nodes you might learn about clinically as you um, learn about different surgical procedures and, for example, metastatic areas for certain cancers that might go to a specific type of lymph node. We're not going to get into those individual lymph nodes now. Just know that they're generally named regionally. So lymph nodes in the neck region are the cervical nodes, lymph nodes near the armpit or axillary nodes, etc. If you know your body region terms, it's going to generally help you name your lymph nodes. The functions of the lymph nodes are filtration, they have macrophages to clean up debris, and immune activation. They have lymphocytes to search for pathogens and infections. Lymph nodes will be enlarged for many different reasons, and clinically you will learn to check for lymph adenopathy or swelling of the lymph nodes. Next we have tonsils. Tonsils contain lymphocytes that destroy and remove pathogens that enter through the air and through food. We have three major regions where we find the tonsils. In the posterior wall of the nasopharynx, we have the pharyngeal tonsil. On either side of the palate, the arches that form the um, areas in the back of the oral cavity before you reach the oropharynx are the palatine tonsils. There's a right and a left palatine tonsil. And then on the back of the tongue is the lingual tonsil. Here's a zoom in of those areas there. You will learn to assess for enlarged tonsils when you look in the mouth. So say a patient comes in with a sore throat um, or something where you might think that they have a viral or bacterial infection and you want to see if that has uh, changed their tonsil size. So here's a really extreme version of enlarged tonsils. So if we're in the oral cavity, then these are the palatine tonsils. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that when you're looking uh, through the front of the mouth, you'll see the arches. So we have the palatoglossal arch, which is the front of the soft palate near the tongue. And then we have the palatopharyngeal arch, which is the, the uh, further back on the palate um, towards the pharynx. And then at the center, we have the uvula. So the uvula is that project projection down at the end of the soft palate. And you would normally not see much of the palatine tonsils from this view. You might see a tiny, tiny bit of them on either side, um, but definitely not as large as what we're showing here in this picture. So this is very abnormal. These are enlarged tonsils, um, so much so that they're impinging on the airway here. So there's some airway compromise as the tonsils are enlarging and beginning to close that area of the oropharynx where the air is passing through. You're also seeing some white gooey stuff on the palatine tonsils, and that is what we would call exudate on the tonsils, and that's an indicator of potentially a bacterial infection. Learn more about these uh, in your ENT unit when you learn about all of the causes of uh, strep throat and enlarged tonsils for other reasons. Okay, next we have the appendix. So the appendix is located in the right lower quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So remember, we're going to draw our quadrants centered on the umbilical region. So here we have our right lower quadrant, and you will find the appendix attached to the cecum. The cecum is that first portion of the colon or the large intestine. Now, used to be that we would say that the appendix has no function or it's vestigial in nature, but that's actually not true. So we find that the appendix has re-evolved multiple times in evolution, meaning that it was lost for a period of time structurally and then it came back. So that suggests it actually serves some important function if it's coming back 
structurally. And what we find is that the appendix may have, um, may have a role in protecting against harmful bacteria colonizing the intestines. So there's a collection of lymph lymphoid tissue within the appendix. We find that patients who have had their appendix removed are more likely to have um, uh, harmful bacteria enter their intestines and colonize their intent intestines, for example, more likely to have a C. diff um, type infection in the intestines. So more coming up in terms of research on the function of the appendix. Of course, appendicitis is very common, and that is inflammation of the appendix, which leads to then the need to remove the appendix. So a couple of just clinical applications here that I think are important for you to understand. So first of all, the appendix location varies across individuals. It's very common for the appendix to be located um, different with relation to the cecum. So the most common location of the appendix is actually curved behind the cecum. So that's what we're seeing here is a retrocecal appendix. So that's behind the cecum. Uh, the other most common is a pelvically oriented appendix, and that is that it's pointing in towards the pelvic cavity and several other potential locations for the appendix. The appendix also varies in size. Uh, typical size for the appendix is about seven millimeters. Um, in the anatomy lab, I, I've seen as much as 22 millimeters. So the appendix can be quite variable in size as well as location. You also want to know the anatomical location of McBurney's point. So McBurney's point, if you center at the umbilicus, and then you also center at the anterior superior iliac spine. That's that curve on the front of your hips. So you go from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. McBurney's point is one third of the distance between the aces, the anterior superior iliac spine, and the umbilicus. And this is the location of tenderness for a patient with appendicitis or inflammation of the appendix. It's also a landmark for the appendectomy surgical sites. And you may learn about those more as you go into your surgical courses. Well, here's another view of the digestive organs pointing out at the bottom of the cecum, the appendix, and the location that's shown here is a pelvically oriented appendix pointing down towards the pelvic organs. Okay, next is the spleen. The spleen is what I think of as like a bag of blood. Um, it's a very, very soft organ filled with blood, uh, very blood rich, um, deep in the left upper quadrant. So again, let's draw our quadrants here. And this is left upper quadrant, and it's very deep in the left upper quadrant, really far in the back of the abdominal cavity and tucked up underneath the diaphragm. It contains lymphocytes that initiate immune responses to antigens in the blood. Um, the reason it has such a large blood supply is that it also um, has the job of removing old blood cells and platelets from the blood. It stores red blood cell breakdown products and it stores platelets and white blood cells. I heard once that the spleen had to be something like four times its size for it to be palpable on physical exam. So it's so deep up there, um, tucked up inside, up uh, underneath the diaphragm, that you wouldn't normally be able to palpate the spleen unless it's very much enlarged or you have splenomegaly, an enlarged spleen. Here's another view of the spleen. Um, this is showing the spleen tucked up in the diaphragm. And here, this is a very beautiful cadaver dissection where they have removed the stomach and the intestine, small intestine, large intestine that would normally be obstructing your view of the spleen. And you can see the spleen tucked up in the far back of the left upper quadrant with its splenic artery and its splenic vein, lots of blood supply to the spleen such that if you have a splenic rupture, the patient can lose a lot of blood. Okay, last is the thymus. The thymus is bilobed, 
structure that is developmentally regulated in the upper mediastinum. So mediastinum is that that center of the thorax flanked on either side by the pleural cavities and the thymus is found in the superior mediastinum. Its function is maturation of the T lymphocytes in development. So it's important to remember that the thymus is the largest in babies and young children, and in adults, it atrophies, and it's very, very small. Some adults will have their thymus removed for certain autoimmune conditions if they think that the thymus might be the source of some of the misbehaving autoimmune cells. This is done, for example, for conditions like myasthenia gravis. You may learn about that more in your surgical courses. Here's a view of the thymus in a child. And so what you're seeing is the bilobed structure, so two lobes in the upper mediastinum. So you're going to find it superior or above the heart at the center of the thorax and superficial. So um, at the very front of the mediastinum and up high superiorly. And that's it for this one. Let me know if you have any questions.